Okay class, today we're going to talk about statistics. Now we use statistics when we're trying to learn something about a large population. For example, maybe I want to know how all SEC students feel about uh, the president or the war, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter really what the question is, we're looking at the process. Now there are around 10,000 SEC students, so if my survey takes very long, I clearly cannot talk to all 10,000. It simply would not be practical. So what we're going to do is take a sample from the population. And it's very important that the sample be done without bias, another important word from statistics. We're going to get into that one in just a minute. Four methods of sampling are suggested in your book, and I want to mention a couple of them. Random is certainly a great way of doing a sample. So I go to the registrar's office and I ask for random student phone numbers, and I do a phone poll and find out how students feel about the president. The reason we like a random sample is we don't tend to get a bias built in. For example, if the college is 20% Hispanic, then I call 100 students at random, then I ought to get around 20 Hispanic students in the opinion. And different groups might have different opinions about the president. So we don't want to bias our survey by only interviewing one type of group of students. We should get a, a kind of a spread of whatever the population looks in a random sample. But a lot of times surveys are done where people don't have the luxury of a random sample. So let's say your psychology teacher asks you to interview 100 students. You're probably not going to go to the registrar's office and get random numbers. So you might be, say, just interviewing people that are coming along the sidewalk. Well, even then, we have our own personal biases. For example, you might be more comfortable talking to students who look more like you. Uh, I'm older, I'm conservative, so perhaps I talk to the older conservative students who might have different opinions in general than the population of students at large. So what I could do is a systematic sample to avoid that. And by that I mean maybe I talk to the fifth student who comes along on a particular sidewalk. So every fifth student, that way it takes my personal feelings out of it a bit. And I, I, I want to well, this is the fifth student, he's got tattoos and I'm scared of him, but I've got to talk to him anyway, he's number five. So that would take it out of it a bit. Now another method might be a convenience sample. I could send an email to my Math 142 students right now and send an opinion poll. Do you agree with XYZ? Yes or no? And I could have 50 answers by tomorrow morning, assuming you guys all check your emails tonight. That's certainly easy, and that's why we call this a convenient sample. But we still have to consider bias. Do math students think and look and are they the same as my population of students at the school? Or what if an art teacher did it? What if an advanced painting teacher asked political opinions? Perhaps advanced art students are from a different group and a different political belief than, than math students, so I don't know. There would be a risk of a bias. I'm certainly not sure there is one, but I have to be concerned about that. And we're always wor worrying to look out for biases. In an example in the next video, I'm going to go over some historical surveys that had tremendous biases in their results. And they were large surveys, so they should have been good, but in a sense, the numbers didn't help them because they were biased, they were flawed in their design. Okay. Now, another important uh, idea we have to face is margin of error. Despite trying to do everything the best we can, there are statistical errors that we're going to have to face. And so an example of this, you'll see after surveys a lot of times, the confidence interval. And that generally means a 95% confidence interval. That means that if you repeated this 100 times, 95 times, you would get er errors that would be within this margin. And I've done a few of them here for you. If you interview 50, per 50 people, the margin of error is 14%. Your confidence interval is 14% from your number. So let's say 38% said, yes, I think the president is great. If you only interview 50, your actual error is 14%. So you're saying the true number could be anywhere from 24 to 52, 95% of the time. 5% it could be even further away than that. So that's a pretty large error. And 50 is probably too small of a sample to really care that much about its result. So I put a few numbers down here, 100, 1,000, and 2,000, and we see that, as we would expect, the margin of error drops. We have 14% with 50, 10% with 100, so that's still pretty bad. It's still pretty bad to think your error is plus or minus 10%. At 1,000, we're at plus or minus 3%, and I put a star here. This is the number you see on TV a lot. Gallup will pull 1,000 people, and they'll say the margin of error is plus or minus 3% on whatever opinion it is. That's considered a pretty good error, you know, 3% is not terribly large, and 1,000 isn't a huge number. And there's a diminishing return. If I go all the way to 2,000, you'll notice they've only dropped it to 2%. So you double your work, and you only picked up one percentage point in accuracy. Even at 3%, if you have an opinion poll in an election, say an election was being held and 47% of the people feel one way, according to your poll, and 49% another, you can see that you have a problem. 
because this number could really be from 43 to 50, and this one could be from 46 to 52, just on your statistical 95% accuracy here. So that means there's probably too close to call with a 3% margin of error. This one you'd have to call a dead heat. And the media doesn't always make that really clear. So I hope this has helped clear up some basic terms of statistics. In the next uh, talk about statistics, we're going to talk about an interesting case in history where bias was not considered and we get results all over the place. So tune in for that one. Thank <laughs> you.